it really interesting. I think it's great. I've got maps starting out with each one. So just so you can see where in the part of the world we're talking, Socorro, New Mexico. Again, this is a famous case, it takes place April 24th, <clears throat> 1964. It's a classic case. And uh, Lonnie Zamora uh, is a police sergeant and he's actually pursuing a speeding vehicle. It's about a quarter to six in the evening. So it's still very light outside. We're in April, 1964. And he hears something, he hears a roar from outside the car and he sees what he described as a flame in the sky. So whatever that was, he he's thinking, you know, there's a nearby dynamite shack. I think, what if that's exploded? This is actually where his mind is going. By the way, let's look at a picture of Lonnie Zamora there. That's the famous iconic picture of him. So gives up the chase, of course. He's not going to pull that driver over. He goes instead... Uh, he drives partially up the hill where he thinks this is going on. And then he walks the west, uh, the rest of the way. And he gets to the top and he sees a shiny object. That's about 150 or 200 yards away. I didn't tell you, but uh, when I was looking this up, doing this today, I went outside to see how far I could see it, 200 yards. Mm -hmm. So like I know 200 yards. I know exactly where it is down. It's like the end of our block. Right. So I stood outside and I thought, how well... Can I, how much detail can I see? And I can, I can tell you at 200 yards, that's doable. Uh, if you've got halfway decent eyes, you know, Lonnie Zamora wore glasses, he had corrective lenses. I'm going to guess he actually had a pretty decent view of things. And then he starts walking toward, toward it. So his first uh, and th thought is that this was a car that had overturned and he goes closer and then he sees what it looks like are two children. And actually it turns out he got to within, he believes close to a hundred feet. This is really close. Yeah. So he sees two, what look like children in white coveralls. And in fact, I'm going to move to some of the images. There's a ton of images here. This is what he initially thought was an overturned car. And there's lots of artists who've done images of this craft. It's an egg shaped craft on four legs. Okay. And this actually, I think, is a very good artist's representation of what um, Lonnie Zamora might have been able to see. And you notice there's an image on that. I'll get to that in a moment. But he sees these two short, the artist here made them look out, look like uh, astronauts. And I don't think that's quite accurate at all. But he does see like these children look like they're examining or repairing this craft or whatever they're doing. And they didn't notice him at first. Then they notice him and they hurry back into the object. Here's another artist. Uh, again, there's a lot of these representations out there. And here's a very famous illustration. And this is them seeing Zamora. And they're like, we're going to get back into the craft, right? So he had a pretty good view. There's not a lot of obstructions. And at this point, Zamora is maybe afraid maybe he just wants to get back to his car but um he, he leaves I, i'm assuming he was kind of scared he hears a roar and he comes back and he sees a flame on the underside of the craft that's interesting and he sees it slowly ascending and he he's now able to make out that it's an oval shaped object and he sees it's very smooth and uh, what's my next slide here? And there's Lonnie Zamora watching it kind of take off there. Um, and then it just accelerates toward the uh, southwest. By the time it, it was gone, there was no flame. It was silent. There was no trail at all. So he was so shocked by this. He made a report of this immediately and actually asked to see a priest before he released this report to the authorities. I mean, very simply, he believed he saw an alien craft. And this case got everyone down to take a look at this. Within two hours, Army Intelligence, this is, by the way, Zamora's drawing of the craft. And he just saw this symbol of on the side of it, best as he could uh, recreate it. Army Intelligence came down over from White Sands Proving Ground along with an FBI agent. This is Zamora in his later years, by the way. He lived uh, for quite a few years after that. Here's Lonnie Zamora with uh, some of the Blue Book team. That's Sergeant David Moody of Blue Book. And 
a Major William Connor of Kirtland Air Force Base. They've got Geiger counters. There's other people around. J. Allen Hynek arrived the next day. Uh, Air Force Intelligence investigated. The CIA had a file on this. They probably had investigators there. You had NICAP and APRO. That was the civilian organizations. A couple of years later, Philip Klass, the debunker, showed up. Everyone in the world except Klass thought that this was one of the most compelling of any of the UFO encounters. And the thing was, Lonnie Zamora was subjected to a almost a continuous barrage of interviews by all the investigators who were there. And everyone was impressed by Lonnie Zamora. There's some newspaper accounts of it uh, that came out right away, actually. And he was honest. He seemed genuinely puzzled. He seemed even like in shock. He had a very detailed report. No one questioned his integrity uh, or his ability to have seen what he claimed to have seen. The other reason that people believed him is that there were markings left on by the legs of the craft. Here's an image of one of them. Uh, here's another. Oh, this is, oh, let me come back to this in a moment. But there were marks left of the craft. And this is what like got people like Alan Hynek to say this was a real physical event. There was apparently charring on the ground. Um, so that's the end of that. The newspaper accounts here, This is these are two interesting things. And it just shows that there were other witnesses. This is a young girl who apparently got close to a UFO in the very uh, same time frame as Samara's sighting and was sick for a while. This is actually her lying in bed that day. And there was another motorist, and this is an article who described the article, the object as a flying bathtub, similar to it. But uh, all of this was near Socorro. So, and of course you do have the uh, apparent landing of an object at Holloman Air Force Base one day um, apart from the Socorro case. I'm not gonna get into the Holloman landing. Maybe we can talk about that in the future. But the point is that there, I think that these people were seeing the same object. This is, um, some of the ground traces again and the charring it's maybe you can make that out there now um the blue book chief uh, hector quintanilla quintanella did not uh publicly give this case any credit but privately he wrote a classified article a couple of years later for the journal studies and intelligence it's a cia publication and this is what he wrote here he didn't endorse the extraterrestrial hypothesis in this article, but look what he says here. There is no doubt that Lonnie Zamora saw an object which left quite an impression on him. There is no question about his reliability. He is puzzled by what he saw, and frankly, so are we. This is the best documented case on record, and we still, and still we have been unable, in spite of a thorough investigation, to find the vehicle or other stimulus that scared Zamora to the point of panic. So this is a big case. Philip Class comes in and says, ah, the whole thing was a hoax. Town just wants to create more tourism. That was just a ridiculous, insulting explanation. And there's no truth to it whatsoever, of course. Uh, NICAP was deeply affected by this. In fact, let me just, I think the next image. Yeah, this is Ray Stanford. Uh, this is a young Ray Stanford here with NICAP. There's Lonnie Zamora and another officer. I know Ray Stanford, and I will just tell you, he's one of the most brilliant, highly intelligent UFO researchers I have ever met. And he was on the scene with NICAP. This case forced NICAP to reconsider their whole position on sightings of occupants or beings. Uh, up till then, NICAP had just said, nope, not possible, ridiculous, crazy people only report this. But after this case, NICAP totally changed their opinion. Stanford goes down there. And his story is actually really, really an interesting kind of final chapter. Um, so late, later in the year, Stanford's there. Uh, actually, not later in the year. He Later in the year, he goes with one of the samples that he picks up back to uh, Maryland, to the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And he says, I'm going to get the lab there to analyze metals that were on one of the rocks that I got from the landing site. This is really an incredible story. He meets or speaks with a Dr. Henry Frankel, who's head of NASA's spacecraft systems branch. And 
Frankel says, yes, I'm going to analyze this and I'm going to uh, run the analysis. And I will agree to Stanford's request, he says, that will only take half of the rock's metal off of it. We'll only scrape off half, we'll leave you the rest. So his initial statement to Stanford was these particles look like they've been in a molten state when they got onto the rock. That's interesting. When they returned the rock to Stanford, the whole rock had been uh, scraped clean. And Stanford just said there's nothing, not a speck of metal left. So he calls Frankel like a week later, we're in early August. And Frankel tells him, and this is a quote that Stanford got from Frankel. The particles are comprised of a material that could not occur naturally. This definitely strengthens the case that might be made for an extraterrestrial origin of the Socorro object. So despite the fact that they scraped the rock clean, Stanford was at least, you know, uh, happy that the, he got this kind of an answer. So Frankel says, look, look, call me in a week after I do further analysis. So August 12th, 1964, it's a week later, Stanford calls Frankel's office, can't reach him, only gets his secretary. Frankel's not available, she says. Stanford calls again the next day, no luck. He calls again a couple of days later. Secretary says, Dr. Frankel is unprepared at this time to discuss the information you are calling about. Several more times, Stanford keeps calling. This is persistence, my friends. August 20th, Stanford gets a phone call from a man named Thomas P. Siaka Jr. of NASA's Spacecraft Systems Branch. And this is what Siaka says to him. I have been appointed to call you and report the official conclusion of the Socorro sample analysis. Dr. Frankel is no longer involved with the matter. So in response to your repeated inquiries, I want to tell you the results of the analysis. Everything you were told earlier by Dr. Frankel was a mistake. The sample was determined to be wow. silica. Uh, and I mean, wow. Yeah. Wow. What do you do with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, just absolutely out of, you know, completely crystal clear, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. uh, cover up of the information. Um, so there you go.